I encourage people around the world, please sit down with your government, sit down with your university, sit down with the scientists and the researchers, and really ensure that you're all working together, that everything that is there is together working as a, a committee or a group or however it manages to evolve. Everyone has to have a seat at the table. And if they don't have a seat at the table, you don't hear their voice. And so the indigenous people who've been working with plants, they have to have a seat at the head of the table as far as I'm concerned, because they hold the heritage wisdom and the ancestor lineage. And to not be included in the discussion is cultural appropriation. Again, the same old story that we've been doing endlessly forever. We need everyone a seat at the table. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Psychedelic Conversations. I have a returning guest in the house, Dr. Reverend Dr. Jessica Rochester. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on the show. This is our second meeting. So this is our second time uh, sharing this space with you. And it's been such a honor and privilege to follow your work and actually I got to know you more after we had our conversation and I recognize the wisdom behind it and the value that you give so much to our you know um, upcoming sort of psychedelic leaders in the space and of course I have my own few questions that I wanted to dig into today I think you kind of have an idea what they may be because uh, we've been exchanging a lot of messages recently if that's okay. And of course, I just wanted to say a few lines from your bio for our listeners, in case they have only just discovered us and you. And we'll link the first episode in the show notes as well, if you wanted to check it out. We had a wonderful conversation not long ago. And so I'm really thrilled to have uh, Dr. Rochester back with us. She is the author of The Ayahuasca Awakening, a guide to self-discovery, self-mastery, and self-care volume one and two. She's an ordained interfaith minister with a doctorate in divinity, a transpersonal counselor and educator. She trained in the work of psychiatrist Roberto Asagioli. Asagioli. Yes. And trained with Stanislav Grove. Again, he's one of our mentors and uh, teachers. And Dr. Rochester is the Madrina or so de Montreal. So I'm going to need your assistance in saying these words, please. <laughs> so you you founded the church, Santa Dime, in Canada. And yes. how, how would I pronounce it? Madrina or? It's Madrina. You don't, in Portuguese, you don't say the H. And it's Seo de, Seo, Seo de Montreal. Seo, Seo means sky. Uh, and it refers to kind of the astral. So... Uh, and it's Santo Daimi is a Brazilian tradition that was founded over 100 years ago by a man named Mr. Irineo. And he had he had apprenticed with the Ayahuasqueras, uh, the tribal people who used, indigenous people who used Ayahuasca. Uh, as perhaps many of your listeners might uh, know, that Ayahuasca has a very long tradition in the Amazon basin um, for... Uh, being used in ritual for initiations, for for community healing and connecting, for uh, divination. The it is said that these the plants would be taken uh, when the tribe really needed to understand how to manage whatever it was that they were facing. Also, for them to learn, they felt that by taking these plants, they would know where the what they were hunting was, where the fish was in the river and where the creatures were in the woods for them to be able to track and find their food and sustenance. Um, and so it has a, it's millennial, the use of these plants. 
they only came into notice uh, through, uh, you know, Mr. Neil getting the instructions to, to t use these plants in sacred ritual and in a way that was community based and not so much the medicinal way that it was also used. We have to uh, acknowledge and respect that part of the indigenous heritage use has been medicinal, that these plants would be mixed with in an admixture with other healing plants uh, to assist with healing or support to um, people in the in the community who who needed it. And so the not the medicinal way, okay? And, and, and what Master Aniel was shown was only these two plants, the leaf of one tree and the vine, no admixtures. And he was given by his encounters with the divine feminine, he was given the inspiration uh, to begin this little community of people who started singing hymns that he was receiving from the astral the same way in the indigenous heritage use, they would receive calls and they would receive these, what they what are called calls or pontos. They would be calls that they would have for, to acknowledge certain beings and, and certain astral um, dimensions, let's call them. And so that tradition passed straight into the Santo Daini. And now they became hymns, hymns praising the beings of the astrals, and 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 then prayers work their their way in. It's a very eclectic practice. Um, I brought it back in 1996 from the um, from a center in the Amazon and founded the church and uh, officially opened it spiritually in 1997. And then I was in my apprentice for 14 years from 1996 until the year two, uh, 2010 when we became independent. I worked with the Canadian government until 2017 to receive the legalization permission, the, the import permission to be able to import and the uh, ability to store and serve our sacrament in our rituals only. So no one should think that ayahuasca is legal in Canada, that anyone can order it and bring it in and use it. No, 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 no. It, you, it's like a driver's license. This is how I explain it to everybody in the hopes that they understand it. The same way you have to have a driver's license to drive the car. Okay, you have to have you have to have the an, a section 56 exemption to be able to. Um, you know, or let's another example would be a bar license that a restaurant has to have a bar license or, you know, some kind of organization has to have a bar or hotel or what have you to be able to serve alcohol. If they don't have that license. They can't serve alcohol, you know. And so I, I'm always astounded when people think, oh, OK, we can do what we want now. And it's like, no, 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 no. Pay attention. Pay attention. You know, any serious, any serious recognized indigenous line and religious line has every right to go and present themselves at the Office of Controlled Substances Health Canada and to legitimately present themselves and their principles, beliefs, practices and to be taken seriously. You know? Yeah, that's wonderful. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving us the overview of uh, Santa Dime and its roots and a clear picture of uh, what is it that we need to really learn and acknowledge about these medicines. So in Canada, and um, I'm guessing in US, there's different locations where Santa Dime they can find. Uh, we have one in, we have one in uh, Netherlands, I think there's one Santa Dime. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few throughout Europe. Now, there's been different court cases and some, depending on, you know, it's been a bit complicated because different laws in different countries and although there, there are kind of global laws on these things, the plants themselves are protected. They're heritage plants under the United Nations Convention they're protected. However, once you take the plants and convert them into something that you are going to then ingest, then you need permission. So there's been, you know, finding, you know, not just in Canada, also in the United States, it was Jeffrey Bronfman of the Unio de Vegetal Sister Church 
Um, there are Unio de Vegetal branches in Canada and in the United States, also licensed. And so people who are genuinely interested in following these paths, then, you know, they, they will be able to find legal centers, hopefully not too far away from where they are. People who are just looking for some kind of law law experience need to understand that these, these spiritual traditions are very serious. You yeah. know, they're very serious. And, yeah. and they really need to inform themselves of the principles and the practices. You Amazing. Know, so it, I think it's not a rave. It's not a rave. It's not a disco yeah. where we're taking pills. It's not that. Yeah. And this is, uh, I'm so grateful you said this. I think this sets the tone of our conversation already. And this is the direction I wanted to go with you. And I find Perfect. you very direct and very honest. And I really love your approach. <clears throat> the, the, the level of also um, humbleness is just remarkable. So Oh, please, well. please, please tell us. Yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can I can bow to all my teachers. Uh, you know, Jack Cornfield, um, a great teacher, a great teacher, and many of the madrinas and padrinas in in the Santo Daimi who have been my mentors and and my teachers. Uh, Stanislav Grof, of course. Um, you know, there's I can bow to all my teachers going back fifty years who have contributed to the deep understanding that those of us who work in non-ordinary states of consciousness, and particularly beyond people who have these profound experiences, that the first thing that we have to learn is that to come away with a sense of humility, humbleness, and awe, wonder. If we come away with God and I are one in a way that is, you know, right up there in a narcissistic bubble on Grant now. You know, every now and again, there's these wonderful little cartoons, you know, that travel around. They get kind of dusted off and brought up to today's kind of standards of drawing and things like that. But they're old. They go back a long time in which it's like, oh, I've had this experience of enlightened. I'm yeah. enlightened. Okay. And then the ego takes over and it's like, I'm better than everybody else. And there is this spiritual narcissism that can, can happen to anyone. Okay. It can happen to anyone. We all have to be mindful of it. You know, and again, I bow to all my great teachers. Stan Groff used to say, please don't project your higher self onto me because if I accept it, then I have to accept your lower self projection. You know, you don't get one without the other. Yeah. So, this is this is the trick for the people who are the participant in uh, experiences of non-ordinary states of consciousness, whatever, however mediated. And and it is the challenge on the other side for the for the person who is responsible, the person who's accountable, the person who has the authority to be leading the ritual. Or in the case of the therapeutic use of, let's say, psychedelics, the facilitator, okay, the guide. And so it's beholden on them to be watching, to be aware of these things, to be watching for them, and to understand when they happen, because they will happen. It's like, oh, man, did I ever do a good job of that, you know? Okay, well, that's great. You did a good job. And now a long, slow, deep breath and get over yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is the, the role of the guide. So I have this beautiful quote around the same time that I discovered your post around where you gently addressed this bubble of, you know, uh, you know self-acclaimed healing, a healer and a shaman and a facilitator, right? So it's increasing at the moment. Yes, Every, everybody wants to jump in on that wagon and everybody wants to be um have a title of a psychedelic facilitator of some some sort um so if, if i could yeah. interrupt you please, Susan, please, just please one moment i think we need to kind of sort out um in a facilitator or guide we are going to assume, just to, to make sure we're using language in the same way, and that it's, I love doing kind of definitions of, of the language we're using so that you and I 
uh, the host, the guest, and the listeners are working with the same kind of understanding of the language. So for me, a facilitator or a guide is somebody who has training and credentialing. And it does not matter to me if they are a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, uh, if they are uh, uh, trained and uh, credentialed in any field. So I, for example, I was working fairly closely with the spiritual care um, providers in, and there's a whole organization across it. And this is a, you know, these are serious people and they want to work. They're working with people who are dying. So they're ministers and they're clergy and they're, you know, they want to be able to learn how to do this. So they've been very serious about learning some tools to be able to work in non ordinary states of consciousness. And so they are going to be taking the words guide and facilitator very seriously. It's not just like um, a trip sitter. Okay, that's kind of something else. That's a conversation. I hope nobody hears me disparaging any of these words. Okay, um, it's just naming what's the difference here. And and then you have words like curanderas and curanderas, male and female healers, who are given that title, or shaman. They are given that title by their tribe, their community. It's not a self-acclaimed thing. They are apprenticed often from the time they're a child. The elders, the shamans, curanderas uh, will be looking at who has the skills in the children. Ah, oh, that one's going to be a warrior. Ah, oh, that one's going to be a carver. That one will be leading the songs. Okay. This one, hmm, looks like they're already going after and opening and studying and wanting to learn the plants and wanting to learn the chants and the calls and you know and so they watch to see the gifts the strengths the you know the talents the call the mission that comes emerging in the children and then they gently start apprenticing them in whatever calling it looks and strength that they have now that's vastly different and so it's the tribe that announces them as shaman when they are and there will be a ritual around that not vastly different from a graduation ceremony where you're handed your you know your university degree and everybody applauds and you know and or you know your acceptance into a certain you know what have you association or what have you and so there's these rituals that mark the completion of or the stages of. We can use some of the Eastern, like uh, the Eastern uh, traditions of, of martial arts is they have belts. You know, um, I, I don't want to name them because I'll probably mess them up. But I think like the brown belt and the black belt are the highest, maybe the white and the yellow or the green or the beginners. OK, but each time. The, you know, the the Tai Chi master or the, you know, Taekwondo master watches the students to see who's ready for the next belt. Yeah. You know, who's paying attention and they've learned the moves and they're understanding the breathing and they're getting it. And OK, now you're ready for your next belt. And so there's this apprenticeship in so many areas in life, you know, flying a plane. OK, you pass, get your pilot's license, but to get there. <laughs> You know, you have to start way off. You start with a two-seater Zesna, and only when when the instructor says, "Okay, I think you're ready for solo." Yeah, you know? this, is, so, this is wonderful. I love this analogy, and it's, it applies to everything. It's not yes, just everything in life. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely, everything in life it applies to. Yeah, it's about learning to be apprentice. Yes, and willing to be in that linear cycle. Right. In the study. It doesn't matter what it is. There's this wonderful story. Oh, I may not remember his name. World famous celloist. And he was elderly, if he's still alive, I'm not sure. And he was being interviewed. This is many years ago. And he, and he was asked, do you still practice every day? And he says, oh, yes, of course I still practice every day. And, and the interviewer says, well, you know, would you like to share anything about that? And so this is, you know, world radio on cello says, well, I, I think I'm coming along. <laughs> this is wonderful. The this level is... of the level of humility there. Incredible. Yes. yes, I think I'm coming along. 
you know, wow. the mastering. Mastery is not, mastery of anything really is an ongoing process up until our last breath, whether it's art, music, science. We, a doctor practices medicine. Has anybody ever stopped and thought about that? Wow. Because they know that you have to do it and do it and do it. And you learn more with every single patient. Because, you know, I've had deep conversations with physicians about this. But what do you mean by practicing medicine? You know, and some of them pretty well known, like Larry Dossey, <laughs> Stan Groff and Paul Groff. Okay? And it, it, practicing medicine, yeah, because every patient is different and you can... You know, you can learn and you can learn, but then it's actually practicing the medicine that's where you get all your experience. And that's where you really learn. You know? This is so valuable. Thank you so much. So now in the world of the, the you know, the psychedelic renaissance currently, mm-hmm. when, when you see um, and hear discussions around learning to work with the medicines medicines in this case of course the plant medicines and psychedelic medicines um in two years three years of courses certification programs um how what are your feelings around those kind of educational platforms providing these certifications well i'm 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 a strong believer in education and credentialing. I'm an advisor to the programs at the University of Ottawa. I've sat on committees across Canada, um, not just for conferences, for but for, you know, for example, spiritual care providers, for groups out west, for, um, you know, the universities out west, Vancouver Island University, uh, the people there who really are developing programs and, and and want people to sit on committees, to be advisors, to say, hey, you better include this and you better look at that, you know, and each person um, has something to offer to make sure that there's a well-rounded, that the programs, usually master level, that are being developed um, uh, will really do the best to cover the groundwork around ethics and non-ordinary states of consciousness and you know, what is it that is essential and what is kind of extra, you know? So I think that the the accredited universities and institutes that are developing programs, like, great, good for them. And, and if they really try and standardize with the other institutes and universities, they should be standardizing to make sure that... Um, that these programs are are transferable, you know, and and that they they are being held to a certain standard of accountability and ethics. I mean, I'm going to go back to the MAPS conference in Oakland in I think it was 2013, so 10 years ago, where I um, I had this little vision that we needed to be talking about a few things. And so I I chatted with a couple of friends and colleagues and Ken Tupper, well-known in Canada for his work, and Bill Labatty and Jeffrey Bronklin. And so people are well-known in the community. And I called them up and I said, I have this idea about thinking a little meeting. And kind of in my head, I thought maybe 10 or 12 of us, you know, sitting around, I don't know, a dining room table in one of the restaurants in the in the in the uh, hotel where the conference was. And, and they went, yeah, yeah, good idea. Okay, yeah, these things, we can talk about them. Yeah, go for it. You know, start setting it up. And the next thing we knew, we had like a ton of people interested in in participating. And so we decided we better, we caught the last room that would only hold, the hotel says that only holds, it holds 45 people. Okay, well, that room was filled out with people standing around the edges and at the door. And we had to make a meeting the next day. Um, to for all the people who heard about it and said, oh, yeah, I would have signed up for that. So there's about 100 people who really want to talk about legalization, ethics, accountability, and training. And here I was standing up saying to all these people, guys, you can't just start calling yourself a shaman unless you've done your apprenticeship and, and unless the people you are apprenticing with so give you permission to do so. So all you folks who are setting up these kind of, um, I know I started referring them as hybrid circles, hybrid circles, okay, because they're 
They're not the religious lines. They're not the sh the heritage indigenous shamanic lines. They're kind of circles that are using either our sacred plants or other other um, sacred plants and or psychedelics. Okay, and and I was speaking mainly to them, saying, guys. You know, you need to organize, get yourselves together. You need to look at your credentialing. You need to be taken. Are you going to be taken seriously? Because your governments will not take you seriously. If you want to be taken seriously by your governments, then you, you you need to look at these pieces. Okay. And it was taken very seriously, you know, by the people who were there, which was grand. And, um, you know, out of it, I, I encouraged everybody. Some people came up to me afterwards. Brian Rush, Dr. Brian Rush, a, a, you know, senior scientist at CAMH here in, in Toronto and Canada, and said, you know, like, what should I do? And I said, do research, do research. And out of that, there was a bunch of researchers from all around, and they just started, and this is so essential. So, you know, I, I've got this little broken record that's been going on for a long time now, which is do research, support the scientists, Participate in their research if you can. Almost every serious researcher that's contacted us, I've asked our church, can we please, you know, these are serious people, can we please support the, the science and the research? And so it's on the one hand supporting the science and the research. On the other hand, it's supporting the educational institutes who, let's hope they get it right, you know, we want them, let's get it right this time. Okay, and in standardizing and making these courses available to people, and, and then you have the people who think they don't need any training and they don't need any supervising, which is fine if they have the, you know, uh, kind of the um, acknowledgement, acceptance, and uh, credentialing. Let's keep using these words. Um, because we all understand what they mean, um, to grandfather in. Now, shall I define grandfathering? Would that be helpful? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So what grandfathering is, is grandfathering means you've already been doing this for many, many years. Okay. And so the fact that you already have, like, for example, there's certain people who have, who have all the academic credentials who got involved in working with sacred plants okay and and then you know wanted to bring and work with so people like that would get grandfathered in because they have so much training and so much experience and if they've been taking people down to brazil or peru or what have you and and working with local people and all of that is kind of in place all of that kind of heritage credentialing, you know, then they would be grandfathered in. They would not have to go back to school to get a two-year degree. Do you understand? So, you know, these are deep conversations that I had with the Office of Control Substances. We had many meetings after we published um, Entheogens and Psychedelics in Canada Proposal for a New Paradigm. Um, and as soon as we published, I made a meeting with the Office of Control Substance Director and the Science Manager and you know some of the other people there, uh, Policy Manager, the people through twenty three years of working with the office, you get to know the who's who's doing what in the office, you know. And so, as a committee, we presented our findings and our recommendations and our concerns about risks and benefits. And so, this is, has been an ongoing conversation. And I encourage people around the world, please. Sit down with your government, sit down with your university, sit down with the scientists and the researchers and really ensure that you're all working together, that, that everything that is there is, is speaking, is together working as a, a committee or a group or however it manages to evolve. But you need to include all the, all the players. They, everyone has to have a seat at the table. And if they don't have a seat at the table, you don't hear their voice. And so the indigenous people who've been working with plants, they have to have a seat at the head of the table, as far as I'm concerned, because they hold the heritage wisdom and the ancestor lineage. And to not be included in the discussion is, is cultural appropriation. Again, the same old story that we've been doing endlessly forever. And so... We need everyone a seat at the table. 
Yes, I love does, your does, does this experience. make sense? Yes. It makes absolute sense. I'm just listening and I'll, everything I'm hearing is just like a light bulb moment for me. And I hope our listeners are really enjoying this. I think this is psychedel psychedelic education at its best, uh, coming from you and your experience and your years of being in the lineage and apprenticing and leading. Um, so... So how do we, so I'm always in this space of like, how do we tackle with this new age self-empowerment of like, I don't need anyone to show me, guide me, teach me. I can, I don't know if you remember, there was an article that really uh, stirred a lot of conversations between people. And then there was some people were taking sides, you know, should these medicines be explored Um in, by individuals should they be always guided should they be just you know because a lot of people argue that they came to their enlightenment or awakening through self-exploration without a guide without a trip sitter without a shaman so mm -hmm. it's a it's a lot of mixed conversations out there and I'd love to hear your perspective <laughs> you, you know you've really encapsulated the situation very well thank you is there's this wide range of experience and operation and practice. There are people who have just sat with whatever particular sacred plant um, or substance, psychedelic substance, they have felt called to work with and have felt that they have had enormous benefit and, um, you know, felt that they've had transcendent experiences that have been really supportive and helpful. Well, you know, that no one's going to take that away from them. I mean, that's their experience. But does that make them qualified to work with other people? That's my question. How does that make you qualified to work with other people? Yeah. That's just the question, you know. Um, just because you took it and you had great experiences, does that mean that you know? Uh, uh, can I tell a story? Yes, please. Uh, Okay, so I, everybody who knows me knows that I love stories, and um, I hope you haven't heard this one before, but anyway. Uh, okay, so I, I'm down in Brazil. I'm new on the path, okay? I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm the kind of person that I'm saying, hello, a supervision teacher. I remember sitting in, in, in a meeting where, you know, a group, I brought a group down, and I was, I was like a year and a half, two years in, and I was deep in my apprenticeship, you know? Um, in, in constant communication with the elders and the senior people. I was traveling with them. I was hosting comitivas in my house and picking their brains and, you know, drinking daimi with them and being in the works was one thing. And then it was intensely working with them around the works and traveling to Brazil at least twice a year and traveling around with comitivas in, in the United States and Canada and in Europe and, and, you know, really soaking it up, visiting all the other churches that I possibly could to try and learn as much as I uh, as I could. And I, I remember saying to um, one of the padrinos in a meeting, I said, I feel like you put a, a, a toddler in charge of the nursery. You know, now I had trained in the Sagioli's work. I had trained in Stan. I had trained with Stan Groff. Okay. Not just in his work, but directly with him. Christina Groff was still part of the training when I first went into the training. And I'm saying, I feel like a toddler in charge of the nursery, you know, and he cracked up. And, um, and so did Madrina Rita when I gave her a similar version of that. And she says, she said, no, you can't think that. You're on the path. You're following the light. You have your calling. You have to have confidence in it. And, love you know. That. I it, really love that. Yeah. You know, so it's like inside of me, I didn't have this, hey, I got it all experience. I kind of had the re reverse. Now, maybe it's just my character or, you know, my teachers did a good job. My spiritual teachers did a good job, you know. and um, and, and yet we have seen, I have seen in, in, in works, I have seen um, people who it's their first work or their second work and the poof, you know, I'm channeling Jesus. And I remember that happening in a sharing circle after work. It was down in a, in a church actually in the States. And, 
and I was with Alex Polari had been leading the work. I, I was sitting pretty much next to him, and I sort of out of the corner of my eye, I think, mm, how is he going to handle this? Okay, you know, how is he going to handle this? It's going to be very interesting, you know. And I've watched how. You know, if people go into, if, you know, thank God for the training with Stan Groff and other, it's understanding deep process, understanding how to support it. It is wonderful if people sit and, and you know, like the lotus flower opening and you see these, you know, all the flowers and the chakras open and you're in the light and everything's beautiful and everything. Well, that's grand. But what if your experience is you're down in the pit of hell or you're in the walking through the valley of the shadow of death or you find yourself swimming in the sea of lost souls? You know, and I talk to people about this, and I, you know, don't pitch your tent next to the sea of lost souls. You know, and if you have this really difficult experience, the people who... And this is why Stan Groff did his training. People who go through that training have a very good understanding of deep process and how to support it. And if you haven't had an equivalent, then you could get into very deep waters. Another analogy I use is, is scuba diving. You know, I scuba dived for years. I totally adored it. You have to, you start in a swimming pool. Okay, you have a master diver, they're called master divers, okay, because they've got all their certificates and they've done all their training and what have you. You start in a swimming pool. Now, I'm a swimmer swimmer. I mean, I seriously swim, okay? And so, um, you know, I'm not a little paddle around with a floaty thing, and that's all grand. I don't, it's just, I'm just saying my level of seriousness, okay? And, and so I'm learning to scuba dive in a pool, and they put, they put, brown paper in your goggles for, or one of, for one of the sessions so you can't see because they say you know it could happen you could be scuba diving and a current could come up and it could stir up all the sand or the mud or whatever it is and you're going to have to be, feel confident to go by feel okay and to find your way you know by looking at your compass <laughs> as best as you can see it you're going to have to find your way and so this all happens in a swimming pool Basically, with two lifeguards, never mind the master divers, with lifeguards standing there to make sure if anyone gets into a panic attack or something that they get out of the water quick and handle it. And then you do an open dive that's only, it's, you do not go lower than 30 feet because that's your first as atmosphere, right? Underwater, you don't go lower than 30 feet. So by grades, you work your way up to the most difficult dive I did was a cave entry at 140 feet. It was spectacular, just off the coast of Cozumel. And I got great diving stories for another time over a cup of tea when we're not being recorded. <laughs> so um, this is how you learn how to scuba dive, you know. And so uh, how do people think that they can actually take people? Would, would, would you know, would you would you go down? Just because I had marvelous experiences, I never thought that I could take people scoop diving. That wouldn't have occurred to me. Yeah. Just because yeah. I like flying in a plane that I can fly the plane. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And this is happening. Yeah, this is happening in the psychedelic. This is happening. Yeah. This is happening. And, and where will it lead to? Well, you know what? There's something that we can learn from history. And in the, in, in the Old Testaments, the old, old, old records and stories of thousands of years ago, how did you know, how did a person get the name of being a prophet? How were they declared a prophet? Can you answer? Uh, no, but I do have one suspicion. Okay. That, uh, that um, I can go with one particular um, there's a recollection of of his uh, life that he used to go and meditate a lot in a cave. Mm -hmm. okay. So actually, how you were considered to be a prophet was because what you divined actually came to pass. And if you please repeat that again, it, uh, it, how how people were named as prophets was because what they divined, what they saw actually came to pass wow yeah you didn't get to be called not you didn't get to be called you know ezekiel and elijah and all those heavyweight prophets of the old testament it, it, you notice there's not a lot of them yeah there's not a lot of the prophets 
But yeah. the ones who, who were called prophets, it's because they could look at a battle and they could say, uh, mm, I don't think you want to go in and fight them today. And then they'd understand why <laughs> today wasn't a good day to go and fight. You know, now. So there are people who have this intuition, this premonition, this deep sense of understanding. And when that was really finely tuned, then they would earn over time, they would earn the title of prophet. And so we have in 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 history, we have, you know, it's all the same thing is you earn, you apprentice, you train, you earn, you know, that wonderful story of. Is it oh, uh, Ezekiel is carried up in a fiery chariot? He turns around and he casts his mantle. Well, it probably wasn't a physical thing, but he casts his man mantle on his apprentice prophet, who then becomes the next great prophet. And so you have this transmission from teacher to teacher. Okay. Yeah. The things that I have received that have been transmitted to me by my teachers that have been transmitted to me by the daimi, who is the teacher of all teachers, okay, the plants themselves. But we need both. I, In my books, I, especially in volume one, I go very deeply into this conversation about the need for teachers and why we need teachers and, and even how to recognize a good teacher and what to go mm -mm and run away from. You know, we can cover a few of that if you're interested. Um, but how important it is to be able to, to, you know, recognize what is going to be good about a teacher or a guide and, and how to learn to trust them and to respect them and to take their teachings and bring them into ourselves, knowing that they may have some transformational process within us that will then take us to the next level in that teaching. Yeah, this is so wonderful. And I just wanted to uh, tie it with what I, what I, try to share about the prophet is that um i just wanted to actually say that um because he wasn't just an ordinary person he was probably deeply uh inquiring about the the, the nature of existence spending a lot of time in a cave it's almost like he earned that process of like awakening somehow yes yeah and he probably, you know, a lot of things are, are are left out of the stories for whatever reason. That's a whole other conversation, you know. But a lot of things are left out of the stories that are gathered together into various books um, for whatever reason, okay. But there's incredible stories about, you know, it, it, I've just, you know, shared one of the mantle passing to another. But this this is what happens, is they go off and they train with masters and they come back. You know, people think, people, you know, there's these wonderful books about this, where, what happened to the six missing years of Jesus? How come there's nothing written about it? And, and yet there's wonderful writings that have been gathered through the years. But he actually went into the further east and studied in the eastern traditions. And there's writings about him coming to visit that have been gathered and printed up, which sounds it's the same way John the Baptist appears out of the desert. Okay, well, where was he coming from? Why don't yes. they talk about that? Who did he train with? And what did he do that brought him back to his his tribal homeland and, and want to bring these teachings? Okay, And so we can see that, you know, they don't just fall from the sky. And yes, there are people who do have profound experiences and get a profound vision of something. And without any more to do, um, just, you know, go out and do it. And who chooses to follow them, chooses to follow them, who chooses to study with them, chooses to study with them. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That, um, you know, how does that work in today's reality? That's very different from somebody who just starts speaking one day in the synagogue like Jesus did. Jesus didn't go and start grabbing people and say, you have to come and listen to me you know, or you have to do what I say. He just started talking with the other rabbis. He's just started sharing his understanding of things and what he was learning about life, okay? What he believed about the divine feminine and masculine, you know? And then people liked what they heard. And so they started to follow him. And, you know, that's vastly different from what's happening now. Yes. 
Well, some people, some people seem to be based on reports, okay, and and some personal experience. Some people are using uh, sacred plants and theogens and psychedelics as a personal platform, okay, for their products, for their services, for their ideas, um, without the training, the credentialing, the apprenticeship. And, and that becomes a very difficult situation because it is, it is much easier for there to be ethical problems in that situation if the guide or the group leader, okay, does not have the training, the apprenticeship, the mentoring, the colleagues, the support system, okay, the principles, the ethic codes. If you don't have that, what's guiding you? Yeah. And, and you know, I believe that most of us are being guided by our higher self or spirit. I believe that all of us have that inside of us. Every single one of us, we may or may not be in touch with it. We may or may not be following it. A lot of people tune it out because they don't want to see you hear no, you know, yeah. in my kitchen. I, I love owls and my daughter in particular and my son-in-law give me owls of, of every, we might be able to see some of them around the room. They're, they're all cluttered up on stuff, you know, and on my fridge, I have these beautiful three ceramic owls and one of them, you know, speak no evil, hear no evil, see no evil. Okay. Which is all, which is a cheap, cheap teaching for another day. Okay. But we can't go through life like that. I don't want to, you know, we have, well, there's, who's teaching us? Who's, are we listening? So are, we can have that with our higher self, you know, where we cut with willful ignorance. I know I should be paying attention, willful ignorance, you know. I know I should be paying attention to this, seeing this and hearing this and listening to this and taking it in, but I choose not to because I don't want to. Because whatever it is that I'm attached to has a deeper meaning for me than letting it go. Does yeah. that make sense, what I'm Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was going to touch quickly on the, what are your thoughts on, you know, um, there is a notion that every human being is a trauma survivor. Therefore, maybe um, internally are. Yes, you, you just mentioned we have a higher self, whether we tune into it, tune out, whether we follow or not. But then if, let's say, the inner compass is uh, kind of compromised and they don't really follow this higher inner self, which then puts us in a very volatile, exploitative, you know, vulnerable states, um, which I want to bring it back to a lot of the people when I stress a lot about the mentorship, having someone to keep us accountable, oversee everything, and and also be someone that's all, a few steps ahead of us even just to, they know the this, this space, the process, and the whole thing. They can sort of guide us, oversee us, and keep us accountable. This has caused a lot of controversy because uh, at the moment, it's all about the individualistic self-empowerment that we are all divine, that we we'll all have this power to lead ourselves. And if it's if it's uh, if it's left in the hands of another, it's just another way of suppressing or, you know, like the historical negative thing that's just been played out a lot. I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to this and bringing this into the conversation. Um, so at the core, okay, at the core, um, I, as soon as you started talking, a quote from Sheldon Cobb came up, which was, all God's children are loved, but not all of them can play the piano. So I, I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but if you know his work, it's so brilliant. And it's like almost brilliant existential one-liners that are geared towards i think he was writing this 
you know, through the 70s. So um, there are older books it's of the era of Ram Dass and Be Here Now. Okay. And so what is that actually saying? It's like, yes, we all have, I believe this profoundly that, you know, that we are, your God disguised as Susan and I'm God disguised as, you know, we can define what is God, you know, for me it's not a male deity on a throne, although I know that's where the word comes from. So you're the goddess disguised as Susan and I'm the goddess, dis, you know, but I'm not the goddess, okay? The tree is the God disguised as a tree. I mean, I'm very grateful to my Eastern teachings that blew open my little Western mind in the early 70s and said, hey, pay attention. <laughs> Your model's all wrong. Well, no wonder it didn't feel right being a woman with a everything male deity. Okay. And so we can understand, you know, that those of us who accept this, that there is this universal consciousness, cosmic consciousness, divine consciousness, God, whatever you, I'm, I'm comfortable with all those different words, gods, goddesses, realms, divinity realms, it's all good, okay, whatever language we use, whatever people are comfortable with, that this is alive and inside of us, that this is our true in essence, this is where we came from before we incarnated. This is where we return to after we shed our human form. And that, that, that however, does not make us a god and goddess. Okay? Having these experiences and working with them should bring us to humbleness and, and awe and wonder. Okay? And I think this is, I'm, I'm not sure if it's, certainly we see it, we see this more of a North American American view, uh, you know, with great respect uh, to all the wonderful gifts of my neighbors to the south. Um, but their culture is very loud. We have a loud voice. It's like the Jim Bay drum. Okay, it's got a loud voice in culture, and um, and I'm not sure how, around the world what other people think about these things that we're seeing, but it seems as if this is kind of a current cultural attitude of um, this identification of a, I don't need, I'm empowered myself. And yeah, but isn't that confusing some things? So does empowerment mean that I'm therefore qualified to do things with other people? We're back to that again, okay? That yes, we want people to feel authentic and real. I mean, I had private practice for 40 years and you know, that was a big chunk of my work was helping people grieve, block grief being the main source for depression and anxiety, right? Helping people grieve, helping, helping people access their authentic self, helping people, you know, find their own inner wisdom and access in whatever way felt comfortable for them, a, a connection with their higher self. Could be through nature, could be through music, could be through movement, art doesn't matter, prayer, meditation, we can all access that in our own way. And again, that doesn't make us qualified to do anything with other people. That's where it gets confused, you know, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure where that went off the track. I've always said to people, I'm not new age, people try and call me new age. I'm not new age, I'm transpersonal. And for me, the maps are very different. You know, there's some beautiful gifts that came from what we call the new age movement. You know, beautiful openings and mergings of things and everything else. And then there's this a lot of what I call new age fantasy, where simple truths, and I write again about this again in my in both volumes in various areas I touch on this, this kind of new age fantasy singing. I I share, I believe it's in volume two, talking about prayer and meditation. About um, and I, I have a conver deep conversation with my Bashina. My Bashina, um, now deceased about six years, maybe seven years ago, I've lost track. She was my main teacher for mediumship, the style of mediumship that we work with in our church, and um, a very important teacher for me. And she still assists us from up in the astral. So, you know, I, I I shared this New Age philosophy, some of it with her, and I said, you know, sometimes people come into our church and they've got these ideas. I have to tell them, no, 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 it doesn't fit. And she she was horrified. 
And, and, and I said to her, you know, people are told, you know, that it's all the power. Of, you know, I believe in the power of positive thinking. I certainly do. But I'm not fantasy thinking. There's a huge difference here, and it's all got muddled up together. But all you have to do is, you know, it, the, it's this, you know, prosperity and empowerment, and all you have to do is think it, and you want it, and you'll get it, and the universe is going to get. Well, there is a grain of truth in that, but not how it's been packaged okay the grain of truth is now way down deep in layers and layers and layers of fantasy okay i have difficulty with people who slap a photo or who are told to put up a photo of what you want on your fridge and see it every day and i'm going to get that fill in the blank let's call say it's a fancy car okay that's vastly different from planning and working towards taking a nice holiday or you know getting a new car, working and enjoying the thought of just somehow the universe is going to instantly give it to you because somehow we're special. <laughs> I don't know how that got into the educational system in the United States somewhere, but you're special and you're unique. Well, yeah, once again, there's a grain of truth in that. We are each uniquely ourselves. We have something special about us. But that doesn't make us special. You know, how did that go off track so badly? And what I want to say to these people is, how does this prosperity, fantasy, new age thing that you've got going on for you, how does that work for the people who have no food, no water, no safety, no shelter, the people who have no medicine, the people who have bombs dropping on them. I mean, people who've just gone through a hurricane, a tsunami, a fill in the blank. What are they going to do? They're going to draw a picture of water and slap it on what? The wind? And say, well, the universe will give it to me because I'm special? Okay, so this whole thing falls apart for me in two seconds. I have never been able to support this kind of new age fantasy of I'm special, therefore I don't need teachers. I'm special. I have these experiences and the spirits teaching me this. It's like, okay, then if you, if for people who don't want, you know, a mentor or a teacher because they feel they don't need, well, how about a group of colleagues who have, who have, you know, so it's a colleague circle if people are, but isn't that kind of childish? I'm sorry, Susan. This is going to sound very judgmental, but I find it all very tight. kind of teenage. You know, I've raised children. I've got grandchildren who are just about tiptoeing into the teenage years now, so watch out, you know. But isn't that kind of teenage energy? It is. It's just a, 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 an imperative thrust towards adulthood where we say, when we're pushing away our parents, I know better, I know what I'm doing, I need to explore, I need to do that. And parents are desperately trying to keep healthy boundaries and some house rules in place, okay? Because that's how it sounds. It sounds like teenagers, it sounds like something 14-year-olds would do. You know, I can go out the back of the high school and smoke cigarettes. You can't tell me what to do. Yeah. You know? sounds, sounds and and that's the energy when I'm talking to people like this, you know. Yeah, uh, people. A lot of people contact me, and I, I'm sad to say I got quite impatient with a couple of the last of them, and I wasn't my best self, let's say. But I got quite cranky with some people because it's like, you know, first of all, they expect me to just tell them how to get an exemption or give them a copy. I've been asked. People have asked me I should give them a copy of our application. Well, I'm sorry. All I can do is laugh at that because this is not happening. You know. Wow. It's like saying, can I have your driver's license? It's like, no, you actually have to go and earn that. You have to prove that you have what is needed to, to let the Office of Controlled Substances know that you will be capable of, of for the, they have to do this for the health and safety of the Canadian population. That's why the OCS, Office of Controlled Substances, is under Health Canada. It's the health and safety of the people that you will be working with. Hey, you would just want to go out and, and, and take a substance by yourself and put on some music or sit down in nature or meditate or pray or something. Well, okay, you know, right now the OCS and Health Canada sort of do this for very tiny amounts. They're not going to arrest or prosecute or anything like that. But once you start serving people, that's a whole other 
whole other category of stuff. So, you know, with all due respect to everybody who has possibly really good intentions and genuinely wants to help. Yes. I have two words to say to you. Wake up. Yeah. And wake up. This so is the reality. The yeah. reality is if you're going to work with people, it's one thing to just do it yourself. But if you are going to serve people, you are fully accountable. Every time I serve Danny, I am accountable. And every time there's a part of me thinking, ah, <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm still doing this. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a lot of responsibility. It's huge. a lot of responsibility. Yeah. It's huge. It's not just a lark, you know. Mm, thank you so much for speaking to this. It's not about even the laws and this, you know, war on drugs, because we got this whole another area of people, oh, it's about the war on drugs. We should all have access. But then, you know, um, do you know, Dr. Rochester, in my uh, beginning, my early time in the medicine, I was very lucky to um, practice and attend as a participant to learn and to also do my work with an indigenous person. And each time, each time I, uh, uh, in a ceremony, a breaking open moment we would uh, witness, somebody really going into their grief and really being activated. Mm -hmm. And it was carnage. And every morning I would sit and think carefully, is this where I want to go into? Yes. Because yes. this is really, really deep and it should never be taken really lightly. Yeah. Yes. When did, we call them difficult passages and they are very common, uh, very common in, yeah. in non-ordinary states of consciousness. When I first started in the ashram in 1971, I was going every day after work, Monday to Friday, because that became my sanity. Okay, So I'd leave my office with my suit and my heels and everything. And I'd get into the ashram of oh, yoga and meditate and chant and, you know, Om Namah Shivaya and, until, until you're in silence. Okay, And I was really lucky because that yoga teacher, she was the kind of Quebec guru at the time in the early 70s. She's long since passed. And she had a back room for noisy meditators who needed to scream and cry and bang. And, you know, we'd start into the meditation and she'd go, okay, those of you who need to go, go. You know, we'd hear weeping and banging and coming from the back room and it was like, okay, deep process. And what did the Dalai Lama say? He said, if you have not grieved your life, you have not begun to meditate. Yeah. So this is another thing, is that some of these beautiful Eastern traditions that had teachers who were apprenticed since they were children. Have you seen the apprenticeship in, to be a Buddhist monk? They start them off at, what, seven years old. Okay. Yeah. so. Deep, deep, long apprenticeships with a deep understanding of the realms that you can touch and experience in the non-ordinary state, you know, deep, deep, deep. Well, you need that. Yeah. You need that experience and wisdom and to be able to understand and, and work with and hold the space for people in difficult passages and yeah. to ensure that they get the follow-up that they need. You know? Yeah, I think it's the lack of discernment, I believe, you know, because of the trending, um, you know, when there's a lack of discernment, it's like hard to pick a teacher or even people really fall for different things. Um, I mean, I get every day uh, almost like confrontational messages like, yeah, but, you know, it's not that easy to find an authentic coach or a guide anymore or because every, it's, it's all and about they may be true in saying that, but then let them form a group of colleagues and agree yeah. on some ethical principles. I wrote a code of ethics for the Santo Denis because there wasn't one. And I trusted Jack Hornfield when he said, if you've joined a spiritual tradition and they don't have a code of ethics, write one yourself and take it to the elders. You know, And I sent that code before I gave it to the elders down to Jack Hornfield, asked him if he would please look at it and see if I left anything else or I would have concluded. And he wrote back, he says, no, it's perfect the way it is. You're doing a great gift for the Santo Denis. It's up on our website, and it says very clearly, you are welcome 
please take this code of ethics into your own. You know, it took years before some other churches would adopt it. There's still some who don't. That's for them to decide. But the very least is if, if somebody is truly operating from a place of feeling called and well intentions, the very least they can do if they cannot get the kind of supervision, mentoring and guiding that they are hoping to get, okay, then they must form at least a couple of three or four colleagues, okay, who are working in the line and who you can, you can establish together, okay, let's choose a code of ethics that we want to work with together, that we will support each other with that we will become a little support circle for each other of peers, so a peer support group. And this is the very least, you know, if people feel like, oh, I don't want a teacher, I don't need a guide, or even I can't find one. Well, you know what? Mm, I have a hard time with I can't find one. Okay, so maybe you can't find a, you know, if you're working with MDMA, then, you know, there's lots of people who've done the research in the science. There's lots of people who you can say, do you mind, you know, can you point to somebody who's been working in it who can help mentor me in this? Okay, if you're working with, you know, whatever it is that people are working with, there are people who've been working with it. Working with LSD, go read Stan Groff's work. What would he have to say about this? Guess what? He worked with a team. So you can actually, there. have you asked? Would be my, have you asked? Have you asked anybody? Have you gone to your local university and find out, is there anybody working in this university in non-ordinary states of consciousness and consciousness? And you may find that, yes, there's a whole bunch of people either in anthropology or uh, Department of Religions, anthropology. You're going to find people who are going to say, sure, I'm, the, I'm, I'm willing to spend a little time with you or sit on a committee or find a master's or a better a doctoral or postdoctoral student who's in, in that field, you know who says, yes, actually, I've read a lot about that, and I'm very willing to be a soundboard for you, you know? So one of my concerns is these people don't ask. Now, I don't know why. Is it lazy? Is it scared? Is it scared that they're going to be told you don't know what you're doing? Because if somebody's doing something and they don't ask for help because they're scared that they're going to be told you don't know what you're doing, and that's the first problem <laughs> yeah. is if they don't realize that they don't know what they're doing, then that's what they need to look at first. Yeah. This is so brilliant and wonderful. Thank you so much for all the wisdom that you shared today. I know we're coming to end of our conversation. Um, I just keep wanting to have you back every okay, month. Okay. So have me back. I'm, yes, I'm all good to continue this conversation, you know, get, get back in touch with mm -hmm. me. And Please do, because I think we all need a lot of guidance in this space. Yes. We all need authentic, truthful conversations. And um, yeah, we're here for it, for sure. And and you're yes. the perfect guide for us, the teacher. Oh, don't go flattering me now. <laughs> <laughs> all I am is passing on what I have learned. And some of it I've learned the hard way. Okay. And, and some of it has been really difficult teachings. Uh, again, I share a lot of stuff in my books. If people read my books, they're going to get a really good understanding of what questions they should be asking of themselves and, you know, what kind of support system or peer group they should be creating. Yes, that's wonderful. So we'll ha have your book in the links as well. Uh, although the title is uh, uh, Ayahuasca Awakenings, it feels like um, you're sharing a lot of the universal truths, not mm -hmm. just... Uh, that's over. why it's Ayahuasca Awakenings, a, a guide to self-discovery, self-mastery, and self-care. The original title of the book was The Study, okay? And then it was Stan Groff said to me, mm, study, mm, I don't know if I like this title, okay? And then the, the, the you know, because he read the book way before it got published, and then they got it got broken into two books. Um, and the publisher said, you know, you, you really should be putting something more in the title that says more about what the book's about, you know. And so it's like, OK, so I prayed about it. And that's kind of how it came to me. But afterwards, I thought, no, people are going to get turned off because they think it's just me journeying in, in ayahuasca, which it isn't. You know, it's all the teachings I've gathered up, what I've learned in um, 27 years of drinking and serving and 
you know, 50 years on my own spiritual path, more than 50 years on my own spiritual path. I put everything I've learned in those two books and I'm still learning. Uh, actually, I haven't put everything I've learned up. My next book I would like to be about mediumship because that's a whole deep conversation because a lot of things that get awoken inside of people is mediumship. And I think what we're seeing, part of what we're seeing is people who are self-declaring as shamans or mediums or healers is all wrapped up in, in mediumship that's being awoken, connections that are being made, and them not having the framework to work within. Wow. What a another gift. conversation. Another, many of another. What a gift. Thank you so much. And where can our listeners find you? Just right off the bat, because I know we'll have it in the show notes, but some people may be listening. You, on can, you can find me through my website, which is www.revdr, Jessica Rochester, all one word, all lowercase, dot com. Beautiful. Just my name with Rev Doctor. So if you just even Google Jessica Rochester, you should find me easily. And I would highly recommend them to follow you on LinkedIn. I think you drop nuggets. Oh, thank you. I'm just Please about to me. drop another one, <laughs> hopefully by the end of the weekend. Look forward to it. And thank you so much. What a gift. Thank you for your time and look forward to another one soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Hope you guys enjoyed this session. And if you have any questions, please do share, drop a comment below. Don't be shy. And you can get in touch with Dr. Rochester and myself for any questions. And don't forget to follow Dr. Rochester on LinkedIn. Highly recommended. I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye for now. Thank you so much for joining us. Psychedelic Conversations podcast is designed to educate, inform, and expand awareness. For more information, please head over to psychedelicconversations.com. You can also share with your friends or leave a review so that we can reach more people. You can also join us in our private Facebook group to keep the conversation going. This show is for information purposes only and it is not intended to provide mental health or medical advice. Thanks for listening.